podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stemp here, and I'm so excited you're joining me and us for another episode in this new year. If you haven't had a chance, I would highly recommend go listen to our last episode with David Epstein if you haven't. It's one of my favorites. I'm so glad we got him on the show. And it also kind of dovetails nicely into what we're talking about today. On our episode this week, we are interviewing Darren Gold, and Darren is a managing partner at Trium Group, where he is one of the world's leading executive coaches. He also trained as a lawyer, as we'll talk about. He worked at McKinsey. He was a partner at two San Francisco investment firms, and he is the author of the new incredible book, what we're talking about, which is called Master Your Code, The Art, Wisdom, and Science of Leading an Extraordinary Life. Look, you're going to be able to tell I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, so I don't really want to take up a lot of time before jumping in. I will say we'd love to hear from you. We want to know your feedback. We are at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. And if you like what you hear, if you've learned something, if this has enriched you, consider supporting us at Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast. And by supporting us for even a dollar an episode, it helps us continue to bring better and better content and grow this mission of satisfying your curious mind. With that, I turn it over to the guest of the hour, Darren Gold, as we discuss his new book, Master Your Code. I hope you enjoy. When we talk about the brain and the stories we tell ourselves, you call it a program. You say that we're all running kind of a program. And I think that is the underlying theme of a lot of what you talk about in your new book, Master Your Code. Would you tell us what you mean by our program and how it impacts us as individuals? Yeah. And I would say we're being run by our program, which I think is an important distinction. And I define program right at the outset of the book uh, as a set of subconscious safety-based beliefs, values, and rules that automatically drive your behavior and limit your results. And that each one of us has a program largely formed in childhood. You know, I say somewhere in the book, you know, I was almost 40 years old when I discovered that I was living a life run by a program written by a seven-year-old boy. And this superpower that we talked about um, before we started is this discovery that we have the ability to, number one, be aware that we're being run by a program and then consciously choose a code Um, And a code I define as a consciously chosen set of beliefs, values, and rules that is purposefully designed to serve you and produce extraordinary results. And that distinction sort of lies at the heart of the book. It it really sounds similar to, we just had on a guest recently who said the number one thing humans are trying to do is to eliminate discomfort. And I love the way he put that because... Mm -hmm. We often hear about things like, well, we're here to carry on our genes, avoid fear and increase pleasure. But when he really simplified it to no, it's just to eliminate or reduce discomfort. All of a sudden, everything became clear to me. And it sounds a little bit like what you're saying is our program is a system we build or or how, we'll talk about how we get it, but to lower discomfort. Is that pretty fair? I think it's very fair. And we're subconsciously constructing it, right? So we don't even know we're building it, but it's all designed to keep what I say to keep us safe. And I mean, psychologically safe because we're past the point of physical safety as our, as our primary concern, at least in the Western world and parts of the Western world, thank goodness. Um, but it's this notion that um, how do I stay psychologically safe? How am I accepted? How am I liked? How do I feel in control? And so, yeah, you know, avoiding discomfort, I think, is just another way of saying the same thing. Can I ask you why that's important? Why do you think our brain or our souls or however you want to define it, value psychological safety? I mean, I know one of our most downloaded guests is Brene Brown, and she Mm -hmm. talks a lot about how we are meant to connect. 
and often think that maybe this hardwire to connect psychological safety simply means the ability to connect in a group to feel included. But I'm curious if you have a, a similar or different take on that. Why do we still value psychological safety? Well, we value it because oftentimes we don't get enough of it, right? In a very well-adjusted environment, right? I talk in my book about um, a theory called attachment theory. And this is the notion that um, the most important thing that a child can receive is the attuned love and care from a, from a caregiver. Um, in a perfectly, you know, an ideal situation, we have that and we grow up and we're very well adjusted and we have the almost luxury to seek out relationship and connection for many people. Um, even in, you know, relatively abundant circumstances, uh, we're not afforded that and we begin to compensate. Uh, we begin to compensate by writing rules of a program that um, have us do things that are you know, maybe a little unnatural and it becomes the driving force of our life. Um, and we can get into, you know, what those things are, but uh, we're very much a product of our environment and our environment oftentimes threatens the basic psychological safety that we're sort of seeking uh, as infants as, and children. And we develop strategies out of that and we enter adulthood, you know, with major responsibilities you know, operating still out of that very same set of rules. And, uh, and I think that's, that's sort of uh, fundamentally what I'm getting at. Do you think that this program can be heavily shaped later in life? Can it be something that happens at any time in life? Or do you find it's really set early on and just magnified later? Well, I think it's set early on, but I think everybody has the opportunity and I might even go so far to say as a responsibility. Uh, to take it on and uh, and to rewrite uh, a code that really, really serves them. So I, I take a powerful stand in this book that says everybody has the opportunity to do, to do that, regardless of circumstance, even the most traumatic of circumstances. Um, now that doesn't mean that it's easy, um, that it that it can happen, you know, instantly or magically. It takes a massive amount of commitment and practice. I use the term mastery a lot in the book. That this is a path of mastery. That really has no end. It's the kind of human, it's the human condition. But um, I think anybody has the opportunity to, uh, to take this on. And so long as they have, you know, the courage and the maturity and the humility to do it. This tends to happen after hundreds of episodes, but I see these themes and they're so invigorating to me. What you just said there reminds me a lot of, we had a guest on, he's a psychologist, named Chuck Ruby, and he talked about how mental illness is not really an illness by definition. And, and listeners can go back and listen to that. Uh, but I actually found his interview to be very enlightening or empowering because what he's saying is it's not that it's not hard, but really it is a thought process. It is a thought cycle that is really hard to overcome or rewrite, but it is possible. And it sounds so much like what you're talking about. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I well, number one, I, I too take exception to the sort of disease model uh, that we're using. On the one hand, I do think it, there's something nice about it because it does, um, it is, there's a compassion, right, embedded in that model. Right. But what I think it does is it um, obscures the reality and suggests that there's something outside of a person's control, you know, that the disease is happening to them and that, that couldn't be further from the truth. And there's all sorts of research to suggest. And I deal with this in the book around addiction, that addiction isn't some disease. It's an, it's a soothing response to some underlying suffering. It's the underlying suffering that needs to be attended to, um, wow. in addiction. Um, and I would say, um, yeah, it's really hard. And in part, it's really hard because whatever it is, this part of the program that's limiting us now had a primary purpose early on. And that primary purpose really served us. It protected us against something that we didn't want to experience. And so why would you want to change that, right? Something that's had incredible success early on in your life. So it's, mm -hmm. and it's also, there's a uh, neuroanatomical basis to this. Like the brain is literally um, developed over time. There are like neural pathways that are developed in response to our environment. So there is a undoing and a replacing of brain structure that has to happen. And that requires sort of ongoing, deliberate, uh, intentional effort. Um, 
So absolutely possible. It's not easy. It is doable, requires a commitment and a commitment to a lot of practice. And the, but the rewards are you know, really exceptional. And what that reminded me of is this idea of neuroplasticity. Yes. The more we do something, the more ingrained it becomes in our brain. And then just like any habit, uh, we can change it. But the more ingrained it is, the harder that change is. Would you say that the older we are or the, the longer we live a program, the harder it is to override? Uh, yes. And the more that program was written in response to something deeply traumatic uh, in life, um, the harder it is to override. So mm. yeah, but that's the part of the program that has to be contended with first. Wow. Right? Uh, because that, uh, the undoing of that, the expanding of that is where people will get a massive amount of, of freedom and power and effectiveness in life. And it's absolutely possible. Um, you can hear just in the way I speak about this, like this is a stand I take that both does really honors people's past. Um, and I say somewhere in the book, you know, do you want to be a prisoner of your past or a master of it? And my suggestion is become a master of it, really understand it, um, but in no way become a prisoner of it. And all too often we become prisoners of our past. We have this sort of myth in our culture that, you know, the past really can't be undone or, you know, it's, it, you know, I am who I am. People don't change. And in my experience, um, that it couldn't be farther from the truth. You mentioned at the beginning of the interview that the program essentially, your program was written at seven years old. Is there a specific moment or are you just referring to in general as a child, our programs are written? Uh, a, a little bit of both. Um, I'll, I'll, let, me, let me share a little bit about my background. I, th I think it's helpful and I do this in the book. I was born into a pretty volatile and some would call unsafe and certainly dysfunctional family. My dad dropped out of school at a very early age and, and literally took to the streets uh, and turned to a life of crime. And so I was born into this, um, this family structure where you know, my both parents spent you know, intermittent times in jail. Uh, there was a lot of drug and alcohol abuse, um, a lot of exposed to a lot of crime. Uh, thankfully, none of it towards me. I had a very, very loving father, and I ended up living just with him in a one-bedroom apartment. Um, and so, you know, I was very much shaped by that. Uh, you know, the way I was shaped by it was an intense obsession with uh, education and learning. I was the first in my family to go to college and getting ahead and achieving. And that really served me. That was the part of my program that really served me. And then there were parts of it that really blinded me to the possibility of living a more full and uh, fulfilling uh, life. The part around seven years old was I moved from London, England to the US to Southern California. And having an English accent at age 18 is cool. At age, yeah. eight, at age eight or seven, it's not at all. And <laughs> I got teased. And I, I, I remember, and I've done, you know, I've done my work and I continue to, you know, how painful that was. But it was in that moment of not being included and being teased that I formed subconsciously. I didn't know I was doing it. You know, part of my program was I have to be liked at all costs. And I became really good at being likable it was sort of my superpower was this likability. Um, and it really helped me. You know, I was very popular at school and I had early professional success, but I began to notice later in life how much it had and was continuing to limit me. I was, I had found it very difficult to have honest, direct conversations with people. So I robbed people that worked with me and for me of, of valuable feedback. And then, you know, ironically, because I was so likable, because this was such a dominant part of my program, that um, people were afraid to give me feedback. Um, and uh, I, I robbed myself of my own growth and development. So that's just like one example of, you know, a response to my environment as a child um, that shaped me, and I didn't even know it. And it wasn't until I, I saw it and said, holy cow, I can actually choose um, the way I interact with people, the way I see myself, the way I see others, the way I see the world. That choice was incredibly liberating. And it applies you know, across multiple dimensions of, of who I am in my life. Let's take a quick break for a word from one of our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. If you're still using one of the big wireless providers this year, 
Have you asked yourself what you're paying for? Between expensive retail stores, inflated prices, and hidden fees, you're being taken advantage of because they know you'll pay. Enter Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile provides the same premium network coverage you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything is online. Mint Mobile saves on retail locations and overhead, then passes those savings directly to you. I've had Mint Mobile service for about four or five months now, and I can honestly say the coverage is better than when I had AT&T. It's just absolutely phenomenal. And I always have access to fast data. Mint Mobile makes it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. With Mint Mobile, stop paying for unlimited data you'll never use. Choose between plans with 3, 8, or 12 gigabytes of 4G LTE data. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. Ditch your old wireless bill and start saving with Mint Mobile. So listen up. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com smart. That's mintmobile dot com slash smart cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash smart and now back to the episode sure and i i appreciate you sharing that i think your story in a lot of ways a lot of people can kind of map theirs onto it in similar fashions and i want to get into actually uh, how we uncover our, our program and our story but before we do that i also want to talk about how you got to this point how you got to this message because I know, first, I know you were an engagement manager at McKinsey, and I was just curious, this is kind of mm. off topic, but what is an engagement manager? Yeah. So McKinsey is a kind of a global management consulting firm. It's a, a really great organization. Uh, and the engagement manager role is the uh, the person on a particular engagement with a client that's sort of um, leading the the effort. Ah, uh, Okay. Because yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very familiar with McKinsey, you know, yeah. well, world renowned, all that. I just when I heard engagement manager, I was yeah. like, are they talking about getting people engaged, or is he talking about the actual client <laughs> yeah, engagement? Their so that's funny title that they use to like kind of be team leader. It's, it's, I think yeah, it's the equivalent. And then I I chuckled a little at this. I noticed that you are an attorney. Yes. Now, did you practice law? I did. I, uh, you know, so I'm here, I'm here. I am growing up in this household with no professional reference. Like no one in my family, extended family did, you know, did anything beyond high school, if, if even getting out of high school. Um, and so for me, it was, I'm going to either be a lawyer or a doctor. And uh, that's why. Yeah. Okay. You know, and I was a debater in high school and I was into politics. I was like, oh, it's definitely going to be law, law. And I, I went to UCLA for undergrad and I, I worked as a copy boy. Uh, in a in a law firm, and I tell this story, but I think it might be interesting to share. Um, a few months into my role, my job there, I worked full time while I was going to school. I got a call from my dad, and he had gotten sued for a major a major counterfeiting. And I had befriended a first year lawyer at the firm, and he helped me write a brief. And I ended up at age nineteen defending my father in federal court and actually winning. Mm. Um, so I had this really, yeah, it was a really crazy experience. Um, like I didn't even think that was that, you know, newsworthy until my friends like, you got to share that. Um, <laughs> and it was like, okay, well, I should be a lawyer. Um, I, I'm working at a law firm. I'm loving this. And I ended up going to law school. I practiced for a year and I, I loved the study of law. I didn't really like the practice of law. <laughs> so now going back to my comment, this is why I said I chuckled a little bit because I, I, look, I hope I don't offend a lot of people, but I used to work in finance and our office was attached to another massive law firm office. And so at the gym, almost every day when I would go during lunch, and this was when I was younger and I actually went to the gym all the time, um, I would tend to be working out with alongside a ton of lawyers. And I swear, I mean, I don't think this is a generalization or whatever. It None of them like their job. I mean- <laughs> In, in all of, I've met, I gotta be a thousand lawyers. I swear like 2% are like, yeah, I really enjoy it. But I also find, and this is why I was asking that a lot of times it's that, you know, look, law, doctor, it's guaranteed. It's, it's, uh, people say it's good. There's a status there. And it's interesting because when I saw, okay, he went from law to what you're doing now and what you're talking mm -hmm. about. I mean, I went from finance to now coaching and, 
and things like that for probably similar reasons. Yeah. Um, how did you go from then? Okay, I like studying law. I don't like practicing it. And now what you do with this whole, you know, mastering your code and helping leaders and executives and others do the same. Yeah, well, you said two you know, key words or pointed to them at least, um, status and security. <clears throat> so you can imagine, you know, growing up the way I did, how important status was and security was. And, you know, in law or medicine, you kind of get both of those, right? So you meet those sort of fundamental needs. Um, I kind of continued on that path. I, I, I got a, a very, you know, there are these sort of moments in your life, and, and there have been for me, I was at a party and I was still practicing law the, the year that I did. And ran into somebody said, you'd be great at McKinsey. He was at McKinsey. I'd, I'd known him. And lo and behold, a few weeks later, I'd gone through the interview process and somehow convinced them to take a chance uh, on me. So I, I ended up at McKinsey. And then from there, I was still very much status and financial security driven, right? That you want to talk about, you know, primary elements of my program. And I went from there into finance and I joined a private equity firm uh, and, uh, it wasn't until a very critical moment in my career, which I write about, um, in the book, um, doing extraordinarily well, height of my career, more, you know, financial success than I ever thought I'd, I'd have family, three kids, and I was summarily fired. And, uh, it was the first real failure of my life, uh, mm -hmm. personal or professional. And it shook me to my core. And it was the start of a uh, incredible path of self-discovery and self-mastery, really taking a look at like, what do I really want in this life? Who am I? Um, and the discovery uh, at the start of that path of this whole notion of like, how do, how do I, you know, how do human beings behave in this kind of construct that I use of, of a program? And that has led to the most incredible decade plus of my life, professionally and personally, uh, including a couple times as a CEO out of that experience, and now um, doing work that I am, you know, totally in love with, which is working with the CEOs and senior leadership teams of companies um, at the intersection of strategy and this area of like human performance. And when you say intersection of those two, because they can seem disparate, I, I, I get mm -hmm. how they can be similar, but. What do you find is the similarity between, hey, here's how this organization needs to run, and then getting into this stuff about the, them mastering their own code? It would seem sometimes difficult to talk to a CEO about this type of thing. Yeah, uh, it's a, that's a great insight. Uh, most of the time, these two worlds um, are separate, and they remain separate. And I think part of the magic of the work that we do is that we integrate them. And I often like to say, you know, you can't transform, scale, or grow a business if the leaders of that business aren't transforming, scaling, and growing themselves. Uh, you know, you can look at any, you know, you know, of our historical leaders. You know, I love Gandhi and uh, his, uh, you know, sort of misquote, which is be the change you want to see in the world. But it has to start with the leaders of the organization mastering themselves and showing up in a way that, in, that inspires and role models the kinds of behaviors um, that they want to see in the rest of the organization. And some leaders really get that. Some don't. Some It takes the experience of, of what that looks like to, to show them. But most of the clients we work with um, have either come to that or had already arrived at that kind of insight um, and see these two separate worlds as totally uh, one and the same. And uh, hmm. doing it in an integrated way can be very, very powerful. Well, you mentioned earlier this idea of status and security. Young adults start their life. They want status and security, not because there's anything wrong with that, but because mm -hmm. in some instances it's necessary, specifically security, right? There's nothing wrong with wanting money so that you can have your family, your house, et cetera. The problem is I see too often the story you outline, the story that is my life, which is that leads us down a path of chasing things or following things that really we know it's not what we're about. What would you say or what do you say to those people who either, you know, are, are in this position and they're yearning for kind of a deeper or truer self and fulfillment? Yeah. I, you know, I'm a little of two minds, but more of the, of the, of this, which is um, people need to go through certain stages of development. Right. And to try to rush people through them 
uh, isn't isn't wise, and that's not the advice I give people. And so there's a certain element of um, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? That your certain basic needs around survival, physical, psychological, economic survival need to be met before you can even see anything else as a possibility. And so if you're young in your career, um, to try to talk somebody out of, particularly if they've come from a background where that was, you know, was really important, um, part of it is a maturing and development process that takes some time and people, uh, you know, need to find their way. Um, the, 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 but the advice I usually give is, is, is the both and, right? There are, are ways to, there's a great Japanese concept called ikigai, which is what I love to do, what I'm good at, what the world needs and what I can get paid for. And there's so much wisdom in that because it's, it's a comprehensive model for sort of saying, okay, what is it that I really love to do? I'm good at, um, the world really needs and I can get paid for. Isn't that a great thing to be thinking about? Maybe not like obsessed about, like I got to figure it out in my early 20s, right? Um, live life a little, make some mistakes, go down some wrong roads, take some jobs that don't make sense. Um, but as a guiding model for um, discovering what it is that you're meant to do and that's going to really light you up, um, I offer that. And I offer a very heavy dose of take your time uh, and don't rush and think that you got to figure it out all, all at once. I couldn't agree more. It's just, I know if you would have said that to the 25 year old me, I would right. have been like, yeah, that sounds great, but I'm, I'm seriously, I don't want to take any more time. <laughs> exactly. And my 25 year old version would have, couldn't have hurt, could, wasn't able to hear that. And so I think the key to coaching, you know, whether it's, you know, career coaching or executive coaching or any type of mentorship or advice you're giving is to really understand, I talk about stages of development in the book. At what stage of development is this human being? How is he or she seeing the world? And speak in that language. And only the next stage is really even possible for that person to see. And so getting a, becoming a real master in stage of, you know, a stage of development is a really, is a body of knowledge that allows you to be really effective, not only with yourself, but with others. And now a quick word from this episode's sponsor, Future. One of the things I love about my Apple Watch is how easy it makes my daily routine. I kid you not, my watch almost controls the habits of my day. I depend on it to make sure that I'm standing at least once an hour. I always try to close those stand rings to make sure that I get those 12 stand hours in. But here's something new that I love about my Apple Watch. It helps me take my personal trainer with me wherever I go. I use an app called Future that has changed the way that I'm hitting my workout goals. Future pairs you up with one of their world-class trainers and coaches create your personalized workout plan tailored specifically to your schedule, your routine, your goals, and your progress. Your coach checks in with you daily to keep you on track, sending you texts, making adjustments to your routine, and following your progress logged all on your Apple Watch. Don't have an Apple Watch? No problem. When you sign up to train with Future, they send you everything you need, including an Apple Watch. Don't overpay for a trainer. Get the workouts you need to meet all your fitness goals and take your trainer with you wherever you go with Future. Sign up for Future today at tryfuture.com smart and get 50% off your first month. That's tryfuture.com slash smart for 50% off your first month. One last time, tryfuture.com slash smart. And now back to the episode. I love that. So you have this book, Master Your Code, The Art, Wisdom, and Science of Leading an Extraordinary Life. Tell us at its core, and maybe some of this will be a reminder of what we talked about in the first few minutes of the interview, but what is our code? And then uh, where do we start? If you're taking somebody and they're ready, right? They're saying, look, I, I want more. I might not know what that more is. I might not know what my broken program is, but I'm ready. Where do we start? Yeah. Well, just to, so to reiterate, right? Your program is this subconscious safety-based set of beliefs, values, and rules that are really driving your behavior, automatically driving your behavior, but limiting your results. And that we all have a program 
a lot of the program was subconsciously constructed, and I use that word very intentionally, sort of made up um, in response to our environment very early on, and we didn't even know it, right? So this, just the awareness of that alone can be a game changer for people. And the first chapter of the book is about awareness. It's this, you know, I, I share this very uh, funny s- story that the late author David Foster Wallace shared, which is two, two fish swimming along, and the older fish swims by, and he says, hey, boys, how's the water? And as he swims by, the other two look at each other and they say, what the hell is water? And it's a great metaphor for our lives because we're like metaphorically swimming through the waters of our culture and our family and the program that, that's being, that, that we're run by. And just knowing that, hold on a second, my behavior is the product of a set of beliefs and rules that were constructed. And I can, if they're made up, I can reconstruct them. Um, so that's where I usually begin with people is just that, that awareness and then I think the, the place to point to is like, okay, what's a critical part of what's driving my behavior that I can start to take a look at, at a, in a different way? And we talked a little bit about this idea of likability because that to me is what I call a survival strategy. There are, there are times in your past, in your childhood, everybody's had them where something traumatic, either serious trauma or what I call lowercase t trauma, you know, teasing, bullying, um, where our psychological safety was threatened. And in that moment, we unconsciously or subconsciously made a declaration. And that declaration was to keep safe and survive. And oftentimes starting there, I offer these three categories of survival strategies. Knowing which one is your primary survival strategy is a really good place to start. Well, what are they? So the three survival strategies, the categories are, number one is a belonging strategy. That was mine, right? At age eight years old, it was the and in, within belonging, it's like the need to be liked, the need to be accepted, right? And I, I had that, a dominant uh, belonging strategy. Um, the second category is a distancing strategy. I have a bit of this, and we all do, but we usually have a primary one. And distancing is like to be above the fray, to be smart, to be liked. You can probably tell I read a lot, right? There's mm. part of like me being accepted and, lo- and loved was conditional upon me being smart, right? And so I have, str- you know, I have a strong element of that. And then there's um, a controlling strategy. I have a little bit of that too, right? You imagine the sort of the craziness. I needed to be in control, right? To win, to be perfect. Uh, there are these, these sort of rules underneath these survival strategies. And so uh, one exercise is like, what is your dominant survival strategy? Um, and to name it with precision. So, you know, mine is this, right? Where did it come from is often an interesting question. Not essential, but, but interesting. Then importantly, how has it served me? And I really want to, I want to emphasize this because a lot of like, you know, behavioral change is like diminishing or demonizing the past stuff. I don't think that's helpful. I think we got to honor it and recognize where it served you and where it continues to serve you. So my likability need still serves me. Then the critical place to go is to say, okay, what would it look, where's it limiting me? And man, that question opened up so much for me and I shared already what it, what it was. And then finally, what would it look like if I expanded that belief, that part of my program? I don't get rid of it because when you ask people to get rid of something that's really served them for a long time, forget it. They're going to shut down. But how can I expand it? How can I have both the ability to be liked, my need to be liked, but also some room where I can put that at risk? And it just so happens when I put that at risk and I'm honest and direct in a kind way, I actually tend to be even more liked. So... um, Hmm. You know, and that is a great place to start. And you you give people a taste of that kind of self-mastery and that kind of insight into who they are and the connection between the these subconscious beliefs they held, they didn't even know they had, and shifting them and what that can allow them to do uh, in every dimension of their life, in their relationships and work. Now you've got somebody hooked on this idea of like, wouldn't it be cool to really master myself? Rather than be a prisoner of my mind, be a master of it. And that's essentially the, the, the thesis of the book. So when you say master your mind, what do you find people are usually searching for when they want to master their mind? Yeah, I think some, everybody's asking some variation of the following question. It's like, what's getting in the way of me leading a truly extraordinary life? And they might use different words, fulfilling and joyful and successful or whatever it is. But I think we're all asking that question, whether it's explicit or implicit. And um, the answer to that question, in my humble opinion, is what we're talking about. Um, If you want to feel uh, alive and on fire, uh, not all the time. I mean, life is messy, 
right? But the majority of like your emotional home is a place of joy and being lit up. Um, the, the, the sort of dominant experience that you have, um, your ability to with not only withstand the lows, but appreciate the richness of them. Um, that comes from this level of, of self-mastery where I am in choice of how I interpret my environment. All too often, one of the big distinctions of the book is the world happens to me. Circumstances shape me. I am at the effect of my environment, which is a really disempowering. It's hard to live an extraordinary life when that's the um, sort of dominant default belief you hold. And it was one I held. It's sort of the dominant human belief uh, as opposed to, uh, and this is an important distinction, I shape my circumstances. There's always something I can do to affect every situation. I go so far as to say I'm 100% responsible for my life. Is that any more true than the world happens to me? No, but the question for me isn't whether it's more true. The question is which belief better serves me. Mm -hmm. And when I'm asking that question, I'm asking a fundamentally different question. I'm going to get a very, very different answer. Yeah, and then I would just say, and we can get into this, then, you know, uh, it doesn't just, you know, oh, all of a sudden, great, I've had that insight. Then it's a lot of practice. And we can talk about the important yeah. disciplines and practice and mastery. I think those listening to any length of time fully buy into, or at least are well-versed in this idea that we we have some kind of story, whether you call it a code or a program or a story, we have it, it drives us, but oftentimes how we change it is a little more vague. But before we get into that, I just want to say what you mentioned was one of the greatest insights I've had in the past, I'd say five years, which is it doesn't matter if it's necessarily true or not, if it gets me the results or the outcomes that I want. And let me be clear, I'm not talking like fake news and things like that. There are truths, there is logic, there is reason. But when you're talking about something as vague or as ambiguous as maybe a thought process or a belief system, going down the rabbit hole of, well, is that true? Why is that true? Can I prove it? Isn't necessarily as, as helpful as saying, look, I'm going to latch onto this one because it is going to serve me better. I don't know. For me, once that came into my being, I was able to let go of having to understand every aspect of every system yep. and to just say, what is the outcome of this? Totally. Werner Erhardt said people would rather be right than be happy. And that's wow. designed to be a very dominant phenomenon. And when you can give up the right, the, the, the need to be right all the time, right? It's such so dominant. Um, there's a lot that can happen. <laughs> and you know what? I mean, this just triggered, we're talking here about psychological safety. Well, perhaps where does my need to understand and be right, quote unquote, come from? It might simply be because the more I know, the more I understand and the more I can explain, the safer I am because a lack of understanding feels dangerous. Yeah. Well, you know, we, this, this is a whole program, the, the idea of psychological safety. And of course, it, as a leader, it's my responsibility to, you know, provide the conditions that allow people to feel safe. But the responsibility is with you, is with me to feel safe. Like there's no, I've given up blaming anybody for me feeling unsafe. That's my business. Uh, and I have full responsibility and control over wh whether I feel safe. And I think we've gotten, a, the pendulum swung a little too far in the direction of, um, you know, shifting the responsibility uh, away from the person, him or herself. And mm -hmm. uh, I just think that's a, just an important point to recognize. I agree with that completely. It's, I mentioned, I, I teach for Franklin Covey and habit one of the seven habits, be proactive essentially means take responsibility for your results. I mean, yeah. but right. it's kind of what you're getting into. I want to go into how we change this. You mentioned belonging, distancing, controlling. Does this process that we're going to kind of touch on here, does it work for all limiting beliefs? Because although I agree that the three, those three things that you outlined uh, are often at the core of things. I also find that people simply have limiting beliefs uh, outside of this. For example, one might be, I don't deserve to be rich or wealthy. Yeah. Like I'll never forget when a coach asked me, how much money do you want to make? Mm -hmm. And I said, but whatever it was, you know, $200,000 say, and it was like, well, why not a million? And I was like, well, that just seems ridiculous. Why? Well, I don't know. It's like, that's a completely arbitrary belief that can totally, totally, totally limit who you are, what you do and how you act. 
So how does that all fit into the structure of three we talked about earlier? Yeah, that structure three is really just one construct, right? And it okay. deals with uh, you know, a certain sort of you know, survival program that we, but there, there are all sorts of beliefs. And the belief you just gave an example of is a belief about yourself, which I call identity. So guess what happens to somebody who holds an identity of, I don't deserve to be rich. They're not going to be rich. Absolutely. <laughs> the most powerful driver of human behavior is the desire to be consistent with your identity. And so if you're holding a whole set of beliefs that you don't even know about, right? You're going to act out of those beliefs. And if you want a certain type of result in life, you want to lead an extraordinary life, you have to have an extraordinary identity. And so I devote a whole chapter to the reconstructing of the beliefs you have about yourself, this idea of an identity and the practice of developing an identity statement. I have an identity statement. It's something I say every single day, and I say it multiple times a day. There is a, not a single day that goes by where I haven't said my identity statement out loud with intensity, physical and emotional intensity, multiple times, because what I'm doing is I'm training my subconscious to say, no, you absolutely deserve, are entitled to, are capable of leading an extraordinary life, and I believe it with certainty. And the actions I'll take will be a natural manifestation of that, not just because I wish something into existence, but because I'm committed to um, believing that about myself. So we hold all sorts of beliefs about ourselves that massively limit us, and we don't even know we hold those beliefs. Today's episode is brought to you by Ashford University. Flipping the calendar creates endless possibilities. New and exciting opportunities are coming your way. You just have to be ready for them. And it all starts with earning your master's degree at Ashford University. It's a new year, so that means new opportunities. Make this the year you advance your career by earning your master's degree. Get started today at Ashford University. Are you looking to start a new career or advance in the one that you're currently in? If so, take the next steps by getting your master's degree. Ashford University is convenient and flexible. Their online master's degree programs allow you to earn at your own pace. You can study wherever you're most comfortable learning. And if you've got the busy lifestyle, you can take one course at a time. Being enrolled in one class at Ashford means you're considered a full-time student. Enrollment couldn't be easier. The GRE, GMAT, and other standardized test scores are not required for enrolling at Ashford University. And Ashford University is fully accredited by WASC Senior College and University Commission. So listen up. Get ready to grab new opportunities. Start your master's degree today. Enroll now by going to ashford.edu slash smart. That's ashford.edu slash smart to start your master's degree today. One more time, ashford.edu slash smart. And now back to the episode. Well, okay, now we got to go here. So we've got 10 minutes left. Let's spend a few on identity because I, look, maybe again, this is just me, but that it, it seems like the core of it, even more than the survival. It's like you said, our greatest need is to just live that identity. So what do we do to kind of break down how we're currently defining ourselves, and then one or two things we can do to strengthen our identity in a way that we want to. So um, one quick plug for that, that work around survival. The reason I mentioned it first and it comes earlier in the book is imagine trying to adopt a powerful identity stuck with an un, you know, a subconscious survival strategy right? oh. rooted, rooted in fear and safety, right? So got to attend to that. Wait, Darren, um, can I tell you yeah. what's so impactful about that real yeah. quick? I, you know, I, I try to be very aware of my biases and things. And I, I think I jumped to where we are now because that's what's most pressing in my life at the moment, right? Like, I think yeah. I've done some of the initial work, but I, I'm still trying to grow. And, and so it's just, again, I think this is just that this is water moment, being aware of where you are and how it shapes what you think, or me as a host, where I think everybody else wants to focus, but that's just my experience. That's no, really a, interesting. Well, a beautiful example of self-awareness in the moment, right? That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a master skill, really. That was, and, that was uh, cool. Yeah. And so, so back to identity, right? Um, it, you know, in, in some ways, it's, it's simple. Well, first of all, I think you have to understand what your current identity is. Uh, let me give you a very quick, short example. I had an uh, identity as I'm an, I am not an author. Now, what, what do you think somebody with that identity does? They talk a lot about writing a book, but they never get around <laughs> to writing it. <laughs> right? So I discovered, wow, hold on a second. 
I'm holding this belief and a whole subset of beliefs along with that. I don't have anything original to write. Nobody's going to be interested in what I'm saying. Your listeners are probably laughing right now. But these are beliefs that I actually held, right, uh, not that long ago. Uh, and it wasn't until I was like, what the heck am I thinking? You know, and everybody, all my friends are telling me the opposite, but I'm holding these beliefs that I took them on. And I said, wait a second, part of my identity has to be, I am an author and I have to hold it with congruence and certainty. So number one is tr- deconstruct. What are you believing about yourself right now? Get honest. And it can be kind of embarrassing because it won't be consistent with what others see about you. And it won't be the things that you like necessarily. Um, but I did that. And then it's a blank sheet of paper, literally. It's like, I am dot, 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 and fill in the blank. And you will not get it right. I often say the first time you'll do it is like a first coat of paint. Like it'll, it'll be sloppy and weird, but you've got to live into it. You've got to practice saying it every single day. It's the first thing I do when I get up. Um, and then you'll, you'll inevitably do is you'll begin to tweak it and say, ah, oh, that doesn't sound right. I want to add this. I want to take that. And it could be a multi-month process of like tweaking and saying it and living it and see what happens. And ultimately you'll land on something that really works and it'll become the thing that you, that you really say every day. The first part, what are you believing about yourself right now? You want to identify that because if you can kind of sink into that, you might identify areas where it's holding you back and you didn't even realize it. Is that fair? Yeah, exactly. Cause you're going to act consistent with those beliefs. And oftentimes it's, it's taking a look at what you really want and then asking what I really believe about myself. And what you'll notice is the beliefs you're holding are inconsistent with uh, what you really want. And there's going to be oh, a big gap. Wow. Yeah. That is just, it's so powerful. I mean, I'm just walking through this in my head. I, I love it. Because then when you say I am, I, I guess my concern is that it's mm-hmm. easy if you haven't really tried hard enough, you can fill in those blanks with things that are still psychologically safe. Yeah, you can do one of two things. It could be that or you can go way too aspirational, right? And oftentimes I'll get that question. It's like, well, how aspirational can it be? And my ultimate answer is here we go again, right? With this sort of built-in need to be right and perfect. Like, don't uh, worry about it. Just get it on paper. It's going to be wrong. If you start, <laughs> if you start with that as an in, ingoing assumption, it's going to be wrong. It'll be weird. It'll be either too aspirational or too safety-based, but you work with it. Get into action. Because we're too often we're paralyzed by figuring out what it's supposed to be. Get into action. Start saying it. The act of saying it every single day, regardless of what it is, is in and of itself the act of an extraordinary person. Wow. And then you'll start to say, wait, this feels a little too aspirational or this feels, I should be taking some more risk with this. And over the course of four, five, six months or two months or a year, it'll feel right. Wow. Well, I, I'm so excited to give that a try. Uh, with the couple minutes we have left, I want to talk a little bit or, or just get your your general thoughts on now, how do we add disciplines, right? We've identified these things. How do we start change, literally changing our brain to to act in ways that are more authentic with who we want to be, who we believe we are? Yeah, I'll move through this quickly because there are a couple of important things. One is we haven't talked about the body. And uh, there's a piece in my book that talks about it, and there's all sorts of great stuff out there. But you're, you know, the way you breathe, your posture, your facial expressions have to line up with the kind of belief systems that you're trying to instill. And their whole practice is around how do you show up physically and, emo- and energetically um, that are the key to unlocking the best parts of your brain. So I'll leave that as sort of a tantalizing part. The second is the practice, the daily practice, the ritual of having a daily practice. And I love this, the very quick story of Jerry Seinfeld who said, I'm going to tell early in his career, I'm going to tell a new joke every single day. It doesn't matter how good or how bad, but I'm never going to break the chain, meaning he's never going to miss a day of doing it. And I think the same thing uh, applies here, which is have a daily practice. I often say, take 10 minutes, wake up 10 minutes earlier than you otherwise would. Everyone can do that, nearly everyone. And what you put in that 10 minute container is almost not that important, but the act of doing something every single day, almost like your identity statement, I put my identity statement in that 10 minutes, is again, the act of an extraordinary person. Having that kind of discipline, journaling, whatever it is that you do without fail, there is no exception, there's no getting in the way, um, is the key to putting this into practice and actually making change happen. It's kind of like uh, we, we talk sometimes at Covey about if you want to be a person of integrity, you have to not only kind of stand 
on your principles, but you have to then um, hold yourself accountable, right? Like you can't yeah. break your own promises and then say you're a person of integrity. Exactly. Yeah. That's the most important promise you make is the promises to yourself. All right. Give us one more. What's something else we can do? You know, we've identified this belief system we don't enjoy. We've crafted a better one and now bring it into our world. Yeah. Well, um, and I've talked about practice, which I think is, is so important. Um, the other thing, it's, it's probably not necessarily a, um, you know, a, a thing that you can do, but something to really understand. And I talk about this and it's, it's so important, but it's this notion that we oftentimes see the world as either or, right? And more often than not, the world shows up as natural, healthy tensions. So like take parenting. If any of you out there are co-parenting, you know, you might have a spouse or partner that is very permissive. And you may be very controlling. And oftentimes we get into literally, you know, not, for, not metaphorically wars over this, right? Between the, the way we parent. The wisdom is saying, wait a second, there's benefit to both being permissive, giving your child enough freedom to learn on their own and controlling, setting, you know, appropriate and healthy boundaries. What if we were to integrate that as a polarity, as a healthy tension and get the best of both without the downsides of either? I spent a lot of time uh, on this, this notion of polarity thinking, how important it is uh, to bring that into our relationships, into our work life, into, into every aspect of our life. I love that. Darren, before we let you go, uh, two things. I've got one question that uh, is totally off the cuff and random. So if you don't even want to answer it, we'll just edit it out. But what is one belief that most people have about C-level executives that you find is not true? that they've got it all figured out. That's the, that's the myth, right? That any of us has it all figured out, but certainly CEOs, right? Because of their status and their position of authority, um, most people hold even a subconscious belief that they've got it all figured out or worse, they should have it all figured out. And so when you see a failing or some you know, slip up on the part of the CEO or you can't understand, it's sort of contempt. Uh, it's met with rather than compassion and understanding. The leaders of organizations oftentimes have gotten to very high places in those organizations, and they they still have, don't have it figured out. Um, and uh, I think that's just an important thing for people to recognize. And then, of course, the responsibility is for those leaders to be on a journey of growth and development, committed to their figuring it out, whatever that really means. Um, that that's a responsibility that they have because they've got this privilege of leading and influencing, in many cases, thousands and thousands of people. Um, and so it's a responsibility that I often uh, will unapologetically assert when I'm, when I'm working with, with leaders. Absolutely. Well, again, the book is Master Your Code, The Art, Wisdom, and Science of Leading an Extraordinary Life. Uh, so with that, I want to turn it over to you. Is there anything else you want to say about the book, about what it covers and how it helps people and or the best places for people to find you or reach out to you. Yeah, I, books have really changed my life. The reason I wrote this book was to, you know, humbly speaking, to try to do the same. And uh, I really encourage you, uh, whether it's my book or many of the other great books out there, is just avail yourself of the incredible wisdom that's out there. Um, it's been an incredible path for me, continues to be. Uh, and I hope that if you do read the book, that you'll, you'll find it really enriches you. Uh, it was meant for that uh, very purpose. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, and I do also an audio book, Audible, and, and I narrate it, which was a lot of fun. And uh, and then you can learn a little bit more about me. I have an author website, darrenjgold.com. There's some resources there. I have a mailing list um, that you can sign up for if you're interested. Well, I'll be heading over there and signing up. And we will link to all of that as well. Darren, thank you so much and uh, look forward to connecting again in the future. Bye. The first episode of 2020 is in the books. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Darren Gold. His book, Master Your Code, The Art, Wisdom, and Science of Leading an Extraordinary Life can be found wherever books are sold. As always, this is your gentle reminder to leave us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to reach out to the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at Smart People Pod. And of course, if you want to stay up to date with all things Smart People Podcast, head over to the website, smartpeoplepodcast.com, and sign up for the newsletter. And if you're feeling extra giving this year, 
You can always support us monetarily over at Patreon. Just head over to patreon.com slash smart people podcast. All right, that's it for us this week. Make sure you stay tuned. We've got a lot of great interviews coming up and we'll see you all next episode. Mm-hmm.